Hello everyone, today we talk about the strengthening of the Roman imperial power and ensuing territorial expansionism between the 9th and 11th centuries. So we are in at the time of the so-called Macedonian dynasty that ruled the Roman Empire from 867 to 1056. Um, uh, following the Armorian dynasty. Um, this is called Macedonian dynasty actually because uh, its, its founder um, Basil I, known as the Macedonian, um, came from the, so the theme of Macedonia, that would be in roughly in, in Thrace. Uh, actually, um, the, um, the, the ethnic origins of this dynasty seems to have been um, th there are no certainties as far as I know, but seemingly they were Armenian or Slavic, or maybe both, actually, the s sort of an Armeno-Slavic, Slavonic um, uh, dynasty, uh, you have to think, yeah, th these were Romans, mm, but one prerogative of the Roman Empire is that you could be Roman in spite of all the, uh, um, all the, the, the ethnic background you, 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 you were. It just took to obey the Roman laws and to know, um, to, be to be a Christian, uh, <coughs> are important, but everyone was there, and this this was normal considering the, the Byzantine Empire encompassed lands of various um, ethnic uh, background, and at that time it wasn't really considered. I mean, in terms of even imperial dignity and um, and authority, the, that was was it. It was a matter of, of empire, not who was who really before rising to the throne, and that's that had basically always been like that into the Roman into the Roman times. So we talk about this very long period that, uh, as you understand, uh, it's m more than, uh, it's almost two centuries. Uh, and um, so we, we will try to make a synthesis of it. Um, I don't know, I think I should start, you may, you may tell me about this, I, I might start actually a um, a series of videos also about proper Byzantine history in the sense that not making these macro topics every once in a while but being a bit more detailed on Byzantine history even though I must confess I'm, I'm not a huge expert and uh, I can't find material but it might also take me a while um, <coughs> I, I studied Byzantine history at, at universities of got manuals and stuff but, but never got pretty much um, thoroughly um, into that. <laughs> I, I stuck to the West, but but I love uh, Byzantine history. As a matter of fact, and that 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 that's um, uh, that's uh, that's why I'm I'm asking you. So, um, but uh, in the in to these um, say general medieval history videos I make, um, I think uh, enough space is being already dedicated to the Byzantine side. I think it, it, it's owed to to the importance of the empire uh, at this time and and so here we go so let's give a bit of, a bit of background so why did the strengthening of the roman empire occurred during these centuries and all well so we can say that um, this was a broad european phenomenon mm? um, sometimes we like to distinguish um, east and west by saying oh, okay western europe was like that and the Byzantine empire was another and uh, even in the Islamic world was uh, even a, a, a different thing. Sure, there were many differences indeed, but we're still talking about medieval times and uh, more or less societies functioned in the same ways. <laughs> the main base of everything was agriculture in the first place. The, the rest was, even in political cultural terms, was a sort of sort structure. Um, in, in, in this sense. So in these centuries we, we uh, witness um, a bit, in, in this sense pretty much transversely into the European continent and not only, we might say, into the world of Eurasia as well as North Africa and uh, a growth of um, essentially an economical growth that is followed or paralleled at least by a demographic growth that starts giving you new resources, new um, new sap, new life to the um, to these societies. And, and this is happening also into the Byzantine Empire. And what, what, what is interesting about this is that the, the Roman state uh, essentially um, had survived, even if um, definitely it had shrunk uh, from the times of the Muslim conquests into these even geographically narrower spaces. But it had survived. It was 
in this sense, the Roman Empire was a, u a, a, a unicum, a, a, an unicum, sorry, in Latin, in, um, in, uh, in, in, in for the standards of the time. Yes, the, especially for Western European standards, because the Islamic um, powers actually had developed something that was um, similar to the Byzantine Empire in terms of sta state centralized state. Mm -hmm. uh, that is obvious because um, they, um, the Islamic powers emerged into areas that were either formerly Byzantine or, however, the new uh, sale forms since, um, I mean, from, from millennia. So they basically inherited these local legacies. <coughs> Even if you take the Caliphate of Cordova in, in Western Europe, uh, that was actually pretty, uh, it w that was a state uh, in this period, whereas the, w the rest of Western Europe wasn't. It was essentially a, a cluster of of seigneuries, of lordships, or how you want to call them, especially after the post-Carolingian post -Carolingian times. And um, there was a fractioning also, however. And But w what is important is that f f from this new uh, revival of economy and, and demographics, the Byzantines came out advantaged by the fact of having actually these statal structures and, and actual even infrastructures and things that hadn't managed to, to keep to keep leading. And it, now when <coughs> when um, economy came better, they, they found these resources channeled already into very uh, functional tracks and and, 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 and and were extremely favorable for re-expanding the empire into this phase. In fact, the, the especially the um, territorial expansionism of the Macedonian dynasty at this time was, was amazing, really. It's one of the um, uh, the, the, the the examples that proves actually the, the extraordinary nature of this Byzantine Empire that was ma managed to to overexpand once again, uh, <coughs> and m remaining uh, an extremely mighty power until the um, the decline of the second half of the 12th century and and eventually the the the, the destruction by the hands of the uh, of the Crusaders uh, in 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 Western Crusaders in 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 12. Uh, so um, <coughs> we have to see uh, also we, ha we should look also Byzantine um, uh, culture in general. I mean the um, the idea that it was definitely a different society compared to the Western one is definitely true. I mean um, the Byzantine Empire at this time was pretty um, pretty equal in terms of standards and of um, craftsmanships and or mercantile standards compared to the West. As we know, the West eventually will rise slowly but eventually surpassing the Byzantine Empire in terms of um, economical uh, even economical dynamism especially, especially in by, by the 12th century, I think at least some areas of Europe parallel the Empire and in certain cases are even able to surpass it. Um, so at this time, the, the, the potential were, was instead pretty much uh, even, we can say. So um, this thing of the economy, I mean, th there is this broad theory that, that we'll recover also together, that the Byzantine Empire, in, in a certain sense, remained a bit too um, traditionalist and uh, concentrated around, especially this state that uh, definitely had gave strength to the empire, but at a certain time kind of choked um, the mercantile initiatives, w which didn't have happen in Western Europe, they didn't have such a strong state, but in this sense, so the very sharp and, and, and the strong rise of, of, of local powers and eventually came to be as powerful as uh, sometimes uh, uh, even a at the point of crushing the same Byzantine Empire. Um, so we are a bit early for saying that at this point of time, but it still have to be bur burned in mind because eventually this great uh, expansionism during this phase was not eventually paralleled by a, an equal um, ability of mm, in, in the following centuries to to take an extra step. Mm -hmm. And this is at least the main, there is a lot of criticism relative to this theory as well. There in, 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 in Byzantine historiography, uh, there is a lot of debate, but general consensus that eventually the Byzantine Empire was more um, stagnating uh, at a certain point, uh, from chiefly the 12th century onwards compared to the West, and that this eventually brought to its, uh, its fall. Mm -hmm. 
some say that it, if um, the path of feudalism would have taken place, like it was uh, seemingly Manuel Comnenus doing in, the s in 12th century, uh, maybe the Byzantine Empire could have, in this sense, by emulating the Western powers to maybe withstood them. And but things are a bit more complicated, in my opinion. And um, probably the Byzantines weren't doing an extremely deal wrong thing. I mean, we don't have to consider these political um, and military and social entities as monolithic blocks. Uh, the fall into the hands of the Crusader in 1204 definitely shows a weakness of the Empire. Um, but it was also <coughs> probably um, triggered by uh, contingental factors. And, um, and if we objectively go close to that date, b some years before, b a very few people could have even imagined uh, that to happen. So uh, real history takes different paths in very different on, uh, on very different ways, and even the so-called big defeat of Manzikert and Mirkefelen actually have been pretty much redimensioned. I mean, there was nothing teleologically decided in terms of the fate of the empire up to very, actually very, very late in time. Uh, even after the the, um, uh, the, the say the destruction, the conquest of Constantinople in 1204. Still, the Byzantine Empire might have survived in some fashion in centuries afterwards and not f be fallen to the Ottomans. But this is not what we're talking about. Just for saying that there is this criticism, there is this debate relatively to, to that. Maybe one day we will deepen the, the thing. Because I'm much, actually, I, I like to, uh, to stress objectively the, the thesis, uh, thesis that the Western world was much more dynamic in potential uh, from a certain point onwards. And that, that this potential turned especially into into actual um, uh, into actual force, but um, it's um, um, sometimes it's more complicated. Sometimes we need these theories to explain history, but history is very difficult to explain in the first place. What we can say is that, in fact, at this time the empire was rising, and even the um, socio-economical life of uh, of the cities of the empire was rising. Uh, the major city, obviously, was Constantinople, that was, um, <coughs> in this sense, centralizing increasingly its power, because it has the strongest potential over the others. In fact, at this time, there is not a very great urban development of the Byzantine uh, world. Um, the other major, the, the other, arguably, the, o the other only city proper of the empire was Thessalonica that in this sense was also pretty, um, you know, the, the Thessalonians weren't that happy of Constantinople telling them what to do. It was actually the only city that had the potential to kind of escape the, um, the Constantinopolean grip. Then were other smaller centers, if you take Monembasia in southern Peloponnese, it was a sort of Byzantine Venice. Uh, by the way, it's a bit of, a bit of an oxymoron because Venice was Byzantine in practice then in this period eventually starts autonomizing, but yeah, I mean, the, the other centers of the empire weren't as, they weren't absolutely comparable in scale to the, to Constantinople in the first place, and even to cities like Thessalonica. And this was because partly Constantinople was absorbing all of the resources coming from, from dual agency, and Asia Minor, Crete, and Crete were lots of, of imperial estates, by the way. Um, um, etc. So, Constantinople was slowly expanding its grip. We'll see it maybe better later. Excuse me, a drink a little. <coughs> the only cities that paradoxically were expanding, especially in terms of production and um, and commerces, were in fact the ones in, into Western Europe that were formerly Byzantine, but actually were mm, pretty much autonomous. So we're chiefly talking about southern Italy, uh, cities like Amalfi, Gaeta, um, Naples, Bari, uh, uh, Region. So these were cities that were uh, exploiting essentially their um, distance from uh, Byzantine power, and uh, and especially their geographical location, so this um, chance of uh, um, being a sort of link between the Byzantine and is the Islamic lands, and 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 prospering through through the traffics like this, 
the the Vulgata that the Arabs came and closed the Mediterranean um, because of piracy is <laughs> that doesn't never existed. Uh, trade was uh, done all along. It might have obviously contracted, but there were also major structural problems in in Eurasian economy at that point. It wasn't much be because of warfare between uh, the Byzantines and, and the Arabs, um, but mm, surely at this time there was a, a, um, an increase. M uh, together, in fact, you see that the, 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 the usually uh, increase of trade goes along with increase of warfare. That is, uh, warfare and uh, it's like an um, kind of a um, an intermittent relation. You, where, where you're when you're not at war. Uh, you trade and and if you can do both things, it means that there is economical potential for doing that because both things uh, either cost or make you earn a lot. So, and with this progressive expansion in, into Mediterranean, to continental Europe, into the Islamic world, all these these things in increase. Also, trade especially, um, and. Um, but however, these cities into um, especially to southern Italy were initially, especially especially at this period, out of reach <coughs> of, of of the stronger Byzantine power. Eventually, there is during the Macedonian dynasty a new expansionism to Italy. So, basically, Constantinople is is able to recover partly this. Um, but these were areas that were still difficult to control. Uh, into also because. First of all, it was difficult uh, for the coercive means of the time, but also because there was com there was competition between the Byzantine Empire and powers like um, the uh, the Ottonians and uh, the Salians, and then the, the eventually the Normans at the very li um, very last period of this st uh, of today's um, story. So uh, th those were you know it, it it was normal that peripheral areas were kind of frontier areas were. Instability was actually even a profitable mm, feature because you could do things that you couldn't afford to do in your own, mm, say, the central territories. That instead had to be the ones that had to be really the core of your domains and being kept uh, religiously sacred, even literally for the <laughs> in the case of the Roman Empire, but for anyone at the time telling the truth. Um, so. And and what is interesting actually about this is that while cities to the Byzantine world were rising, you know, it, it, it essentially as trade centers. However, in 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 the rural areas of the empire, that by the way constituted the majority of of the both of the population and even of you know, geographical extension, there was a crisis of um, that. Um, can can say uh, small and middle landowners that had been uh, the backbone of of the em political and, and even military organization of the empires in the in the years before. So this uh, landed gentry was essentially the one of, of the soldiers uh, of the peasant soldiers we can say uh, the so-called um, I think in Greek it's stratiotes something like that stratios. Uh, if you want the Anglo uh, anglicization, and um, so this was, uh, they were essentially, um, I mean, they were both soldiers and free peasants. Essentially, soldiers were. Now there is no time to to explain how it really worked before, but let's say the important thing, the core uh, concept now is that um, these um, these people had essentially been crucial for. The um, the survival of the empire in the uh, during the uh, Arab invasions of the previous centuries, because this great pressure, especially on the eastern border against the Arabs, uh, had been um, um, withstood thanks to the resistance of these um, of these settlers, and uh, had managed the the empire to to keep. And th this is very important. This goes along with what we were saying before with. Uh, centralization and decentralization because in early medieval times yeah even the Byzantine Empire was this uh, strong centralized entity for the time it was still 
pretty weak for our SATO standards. And, and the only way to even maintain certain territories, even not extremely far from the capital, was to settle people there, which was something that was done all along in pre-industrial times. If you want to um, uh, safeguard a frontier, you settle people there so that um, yeah you can give th you can help them of course if there is a major invasion you have necessarily to send the army because colons are not enough to withstand an organized a thorough invasion but uh, in terms of brigandage and other minor incursions of, of smaller scale ha having settlers settlers there was was perfectly fine it was a, an ancient roman thing roman colonies in back in the day were essentially created for this in fact in Ro in to Ro the Roman Republic, the Roman colonists were exempted for mil from military service into the legions because um, because their presence in two certain frontier lands already equated to a sort of military service. Also, the Persians did that. Also, I think also the Arabs at this point did that even. Um, and um, so it was completely uh, average by those times. But it, it had been pretty effective because the, in the Byzantine case this had been coupled with a very efficient statal administration, um, a very uh, first uh, order military, and, 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 and that had held. In spite of all the avalanche of peoples that tried to, to, to invade uh, the empire. Excuse me, I'm clearing the microphone a little. So, um, so this was so. Wh why this uh, happened? Well, it happened like in old times of expansion of um, economy, of relatively uncontrolled expansion of the economy. That essentially the great landed estates, so the people who have more money, tend to expand uh, at the expenses of uh, of the smaller. Uh, owners. So these l uh, great land owners in the Byzantine Empire were chiefly the church, uh, because the, the, the church in, into in to the Roman Empire this time was extreme as a, a sort of state within the state, mm -hmm. even if it was framed uh, institutionally speaking in, in, in a very different fashion um, uh, in, in the empire compared, say, to Western Europe. Um, at this time, it was, however, still relatively free. Now, the Macedonians eventually kind of, with um, Caesaro papism, try to 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 be are able to even to 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 control it even more. But let's say that in in the country, so you, even in areas where relatively far from 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 Constantinople, uh, the clergy definitely expands pretty much in, into these land estates. So do the uh, the, uh, the military men of higher rank. There were also these very uh, Im important figures, also in the Constantinopolitan court, as well as, in this sense, the most influent um, characters into the um, military and civil civil administration. So all people that were really revolving around Constantinople in a way or in another, because they belong not to the local gentry. No, I mean, they might do, but they they still have privileged bonds with the capital, and in this sense having a, you know, maybe uh, wh while they were doing these abuses and expanding their their ter their, their property at the expense of, of someone else, making uh, the peasants getting poorer and less freer and kind of subduing them, well, not extremely differently from what was happening to Western Europe at the same time. The maybe Constantinople was looking at it the other <laughs> from another side, also because it was convenient for the same Constantinople to do so, because um, by controlling these major nobles, uh, they could control larger areas um, of, and, and, and this partially also was more economical, because it meant that through the, f the fealty of that mm, pr mm, individual, you could control of a wider area without with a decentralized government without having to actually pay for the local administration, I mean to intervene directly in a more centralized fashion. However, this was um, pretty um, a double-edged um, mm, uh, thing because um, it, it was understood even by the same Roman emperors 
especially some of the, the most important, the, the greatest ones of the time, I remember partially also for this reason, that this wasn't a good thing. Because obviously this also equated in turn to make certain mm, characters within the Empire to be extremely powerful and also prone maybe to to, um, to revolt which occurred extensively. Uh, recently I talked on the channel about uh, the um, Tagmatic army. It was created at this point, in fact, in Constantinople because of the revolts that were occurring, that were uh, led by um, against the central government by these uh, provincial um, aristocracy, essentially. So the idea was cr to create a sort of Constantinopolitan army of professionals to stem this this um, um, and even to control in part obviously this uh, provincial uh, forces um, so actually the uh, the um, the smaller property um, to uh, to the small and medium property um, to be protected and, uh, and Roman emperors like uh, Romanus um, Lecapenus ruled from 920 to 944. Constantine uh, the seventh Porphyrogenitus. Everybody he was Porphyrogenitus generally <laughs> at this time, but he sometimes we remember the names of the, the nicknames of these emperors for certain historiographical reasons rather than how they were called at the time. Ruled from nine on, uh, 944 to no 959, and even later Basil the second was uh, probably the greatest emperor, uh, of, you know, at least in medieval times, world from 976 to uh, 1025, we also, uh, and, and we are with Basil II we are already at a pretty later stage of this, of the decline of the um, a small and, 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 and medium property, so um, it was something really felt over time because um, th this 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 free men, this free peasants could be pretty useful and sometimes very loyal actually to to the to Constantinople, and um, and, and with these laws that were elaborated um, to protect them, um, do w it was forbidden um, in um, in case of uh, during the purchase of land that, that these uh, lesser uh, properties could um, finish in to the hands of the major uh, landowners, so it was something even pretty, pretty um, political in many ways. It was something pretty evident. It was being tried from the, um, at least from 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 these emperors, um, and uh, the um, so the 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 process, however, was very difficult to stem, very dif difficult to halt because in these are not things that only happen because of uh, a political direction or not. There are also major structural factors uh, that are difficult to, to, to cope with um, at this point. And um, there is a general, throughout all these periods, there is a relatively steady uh, impoverishment of the rural um, of the rural classes, let's say. And um, so this uh, also had a, a one major problem that was that the same imperial authority had needed taxes to be paid to, f to, to finance military operations that were pretty intense at this time. So uh, the backbone of the empire also in fiscal terms was what could be taken from from the countryside in terms of revenues and all. So um, this was a bit of a uh, double there were certain double standards in some some measure, and there were certain emperors, by the way, who instead, on the contrary, encouraged this impoverishment, to say, um, uh, of the local uh, um, of the country uh, commoners. Uh, also, because just like uh, Nicephorus uh, Phocas, mm, who ruled from 963 to 969, simply because he belonged himself to the great landed. Um, aristocracy, and, <laughs> and and therefore he um, he exploited his position 
uh, to, to do that. I, the Kaiser of Vogus is also one of the greatest uh, Byzantine emperors, by the way. I, I think I told I, I talked about him just about the Nikephor uh, relatively to the so-called Nikephorian cataphracts were. Um, yeah, made a video about those that were revived uh, under his reign, and and so uh, it's even difficult to find, you know, who was really uh, right or wrong in here because there were certain needs in, ter in terms also of political and administrative terms that were very difficultly solvable in in, in different ways. So. Unfor I say unfortunately now we, we look at it from a modern perspective as if uh, we, 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 s we appreciate freedom uh, but um, it's um, at those times you have to you know while deciding these things you have to understand the perspectives of, of anyone involved and yeah pretty bad things were done indeed but also ruling an empire w like, the, uh, like that one was not easy uh, and certain bad choices had to be made in part, even in order to make the, the empire survive. So what is interesting, however, uh, uh, as a conclusion of this part is um, is that uh, the both w Western and Eastern Europe, um, say, in this sense, the Eastern Byzantine Europe, um, were actually developing in similar ways. Mm -hmm. So the rise of seigneurial power in the countryside was something transversal. In this sense, and the relative societies were um, transformed. In fact, we like to stress, rightfully, that the Byzantine Empire was was a state, while f Western Europe was was feudal. Um, but if if you look at uh, even the, the structure, the em uh, if you look even at, at the empire, uh, how it was at this time, well, it was slowly turning it towards a privatization. It, it's pretty much evident. Um, basically, by the the end of these times, uh, by the eleventh century, uh, it, the, the the whole empire was a sort of of a big private domain, either of the ch uh, of the church or of the major um, Constantinopolitan uh, nobility. So, uh, so of the so-called Okayaka of of Constantinople, with these major quarters that were owned by these very um, strong families, and very wealthy families that all had properties all around the empire and, and drew drew resources uh, into Constantinople and that's why also Constantinople is re over, let's say, expanding once again because of th all these resources drawn from the rest of the empire that otherwise was growing increasingly subjected to, to, to the city. So uh, it's a very, in a very, very private fashion and then eventually you see even with the Pronoia system the how it was developed and uh, uh, was essentially something very s close to, to, to the feudal, I even if it was conceptually different, because the, the major difference really in this sense is that the Byzantines, yeah, they were doing something similar to the, uh, the Westerners when they were entrusting some lands, some provinces to, to, a, to a lord and say, okay, govern it for us. The only difference is that um, uh, while in Europe there was not a central power that could really check the power of, of these uh, vassals, in, in the Byzantine Empire the central state, Constantinople, was still able to take those lands back. I mean, very theoretically, telling the truth also in here, but still in a measure was pretty different. Um, after all, even Western feudalism from Carolingian times had been born with this idea. It's not that there were many different diff cultural differences I from from this strict point of view. I mean, theoretically, the land belongs still to the king, even into the feudal world. But who could in Western Europe, as a king, claim those lands back? I mean, there weren't such powers until... Uh, I mean, th this was normal, the standard in feudal Europe. The Byzantine Empire was, uh, empire was a, a little bit different. But the the trend of evolution was towards the same uh, direction. So, um, what else can we say? Um, so yeah, basically, um, as we were saying, this, th th this events revolving around the, the transformation of uh, Byzantine society um, were spreading in, into the countryside, these relations of personal dependence from the um, landowners, uh, the peasants got uh, got uh, uh, goat, the, 
the peasant goat um, sure there were peasant goats there <laughs> um, got um, increasingly more uh, subjected to the local lords just like in the west uh, with this difference of the Byzantine state, however, being still there, mm. even sometimes with the same face in this sense. Mm. So the, um, the, the political administrative efficiency of, of the empire was exploiting part also this situation, um, either to limit the power of the lords um, there, and to, in parts, to to allow that, uh, however, in the measure into which this wasn't detrimental to um, to the imperial authority, uh, and, and and it's a preventing the formation of a vassalatic a class that could, in this sense, um, do uh, as as they pleased in, in, in lo locally speaking. So at the same time, there is a strengthening of of imperial power especially uh, between the 8th and the 9th century, the risk of consolidation of uh, imperial power through um, certain, let's say, the strengthening of certain um, political and sacral prerogatives that um, emphasize the, actually, w what had been the traditional, uh, traditionally institutional um, role of the emperor in into, into the East. Um, the emperor was, by by standard, by name, etymologically speaking, the um, the army leader, the army, the chief, of, uh, the head of the army, and uh, but he was also at uh, the head of the administrative and in the judiciary um, uh, system. Uh, so this was very very important because um, by the way the Westerners at this point was, were, were looking with with lust <laughs> such a model because the greatest problem there is that having the Roman state vanished and having just these experiments like the Carolingian Empire and the Holy Roman Empire that had a very yeah th they had some power tell the they were empires really but they weren't really structured in a settled fashion and and the greatest problem was, in fact, to maintain even their own prerogatives, think, thinking about the clash for investors, that at this time it's not really happening, but uh, that happened later, but it, it kind of was, there, there had already been the, the major problems between emperor and, 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 and popes to say, who is here that has the, the upper hand, I mean, in, in practical power. That could happen only in the West. In, in the East, the Church was, since the times of Constantine, um say um subjected to to the emperor and not the other way around sure the church had trials in there to 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 get freer from from sacred power but they had not managed it because the state had remained strong and the church unlike in many areas of western europe had not really taken over at the moment of default the collapse of the whole of the roman empire um so um in this sense, there are very big and substantial differences in institutional and social-political terms uh, relatively between the West and the East. And um, as the mm, uh, so the, the the emperor was the also the supreme legislator, as we said, that is also a very important thing because it's for essentially an absolute power. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, wh while in the West this was not really done because the West was um, intensely Germanized in, in terms of political culture and, 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 and uh, Germanic political culture was based on the fact that um, the head, the, the king, was essentially elected chiefly for military reasons but it was just a, um, a first among equals. So that tells much about how the difference really was. Here in, in the Byzantine Empire, in the Roman Empire, the emperor is the head of the whole empire. Mm. So there were also probably certain mm, corporalist theories that eventually were developed also into corporative theories, not corporalist, uh, corporative theories that were uh, developed into the, in, into the West later when in fact uh, the monarchy power got stronger into the lower middle ages 
and there was this um, also very important religious role that the emperor had that uh, uh, was expressed by his supremacy on the church now the in, and on ecclesiastical affairs in great um, and all that is entailed from from a spiritual point of view this is called uh, Caesaro pa uh, papism so this is the idea of being Caesar and Pope at the same time and um, so he the, the, the Roman emperors considered themselves as the um, the earthly uh, rep representatives of divine uh, of divine authority mm, just like the popes and uh, this is what naturally in the West was much more problematic because of the relation between the, the emperors and the popes and this general political weakness um, uh, that could make you know the, the, the whole thing very uh, difficult to solve uh, into in the Byzantine Empire this was instead very and so the emperors were uh, the Roman emperors were defenders of the church and especially of the um, uh, erect um, doctrine now that was also a very important thing and actually had created also problems in the past because especially in during the early Middle Ages uh, the Byzantine emperors had tried essentially to 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 make certain doctrinal I can't, ch I think I can't say changes because the, the Nichan um, creed was was always pretty much uh, there but um, let's say to trying to appease certain heterodox were not o openly a radical movements like it happened with monophysism or rather currents that especially in, in this was a problem as long as uh, the Byzantines managed to, to control Syria Palestine and Egypt were these um, um, heterodoxy had been telling truth instrumental also to in fact to oppose to, to, to Constantinople's um, government in there um, so in order to preserve this very rich and wealthy and especially agricultural productive areas of the empire uh, the Byzantine emperors has kind of tried to, to lean towards those areas a little bit and, 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 and the popes from, from Italy were saying what, what, ha what the hell are you doing? <laughs> and they were right by the way in this sense during the early Middle Ages the, the Western church was much more um, orthodox than, than the Eastern one then eventually with the Gregorian reforms in the 11th century and uh, in, in the 12th things start to evolve in a different way because obviously the popes of Rome built this uh, idea of supremacy of secular power that was completely unknown to the Byzantine world and that had very m in a sense very um, um, debatable basis and um, so um, but this was very important because doctrine was a way really to um, uh, it wasn't just a um, you know, a matter of faith. It was really also a matter of political tools. So, um, uh, the the power of the Roman Empire at this point is expressed also by the way w in to which uh, the 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 Roman Roman emperors dealt with um, doctrinal matters. There were lots of political um, infights at this time, and not major and serious uh, heresies like in the past. But um, let's say many, uh, even many uh, factional differences into, you know, political factions have always existed throughout history. So even if, you know, at the Constantinople in a court or in Constantinople, there were sides of aristocrats at this time who maybe uh, backed that um, patriarch's view on uh, on that doctrinal issue, and the, the others did the opposite. So what the emperor could say in this sense was also very important in to to back this or that political faction and and uh, there were actually very big you know if you study Byzantine history in detail you realize that this went all along I mean, there was never a moment <laughs> to which uh, doctrinal matters uh, that to us might seem even like small details but that Theologically speaking, by the way, very important that even that politically speaking had this great impact eventually. It have always been there. Uh, and what is fascinating is that um, Roman emperors were extremely, usually at least, not always, but by standard, pretty much well educated mm, at this time. So uh, it was not like in, in the West where, I don't know, the Carolingians were 
really uh, go to ignorant. Um, and even if they, I must say that they <laughs> they at least made the effort to try to understand things. Uh, Charlemagne was a pretty intellectually curious person. Uh, hey, but there were still Franks. Come on, <laughs> no little joke about Franks. Um, uh, but uh, but th this also existed in, in, in as a matter of fact. And this was seen, was perceived, especially when uh, eventually there were um, imperial marriages. You know, you know, the the Ottonian marriage with um, Teofano and and Otto II, for instance. And uh, there, w there was this conscious appearance that uh, basically the, the the Byzantines considered the Germans to be barbarians and uh, ignorant and completely. And they never recognized, uh, this is a very important thing, they never recognized their imperial dignity. Never. Even if they made her that um, uh, imperial princess born in, 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 in the purple, um, um, to them that wasn't. And there was a lot, of still very lot of, uh, lot of uh, enmity, especially into Italy between the Ottonians and Byzantines who had to conquer. It was usually Italy the battleground with the with the, the Western uh, w with the Western Empire. Um, and the mm, and, and and however the uh, even in spite of this enmity obviously the Westerners who knew that by right weren't uh, Roman emperors because this thing well I don't want to enter into details now because it's one of the by the way it's one of those things w for which people really uh, get uh, with knives at each other guts, <laughs> but um, at least from a juridical point of view, obviously the Holy Roman Empire was not really a r the Roman Empire because by Roman right, only another emperor can name another uh, co-emperor uh, or designate uh, its successor. Uh, in the West, it, they it basically had been the Franks and the Popes <laughs> that had decided to create this, and 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 the Byzantines looked at uh, disgust uh, to this, and and even with the um, cultural um, incomprehension, because they completely they they couldn't understand that. I mean, it, it was completely external to to their mind. There was based on very uh, completely different bases, and. Um, so these are interesting also perspectives to consider. Maybe one day I will make a video about them specifically. So one m major prerogative uh, of the of the Byzantine Caesaro papism was was the uh, imperial uh, 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 direct control of the patriarchal election mm -hmm. uh, of the patriarch of Constantinople. So. Uh, so basically, if you were an, uh, a Byzantine emperor, you could even remove freely, at least theoretically, uh, the patriarch uh, when when you wished. Also, in here, you couldn't really do it like a snap because maybe the patriarch was backed by your your rival uh, party, and uh, it would have I don't know triggered civil war and s strifes and all. So. It's not uh, even that simple, but uh, we can say that um, Caesar of Papism determined, however, uh, nor it could be differently, uh, by the way. Um, this extreme, extremely strong and, s and, 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 and close tie between state and church. Mm -hmm. um, so this uh, practically was th the greatest indicator of um, of imperial strength into the Roman Empire at this time. Um, the uh, there is the the, the 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 event of the Patriarch Fotius, for instance, selected in 858. Now these patriarchs were extremely cultured people. Um, the in the ecclesiastical career entailed. Uh, uh, one of the highest educations of, of of the time, just like a bit like in the West as well, because in the West, uh, clergymen were extremely cultured compared to at least to the Western average. Um, and and Fotius, um, he is famous for, for also for other reasons. Now maybe now we will name that, but he um, relatively to 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 Caesar Papas, and he actually tried to counter the imperial. Um, ambitions in this in this sense by um, kind of stemming uh, 
imperial interfer interference into ecclesiastical matters because because also in here you don't have to think of the Byzantine Empire as this perfectly harmonious harmonic thing but the church was happy being under the emperors it had happened so and anyone who has power including the clergy now uh, wants to to keep it so the were um, in this time um, the um, the strength of imperial power is is also happening at the expense of the ecclesiastical one in part, and and and, and imperial power was so, was so strong that indeed Vodzu's uh, attempt uh, failed practically, and and after him there was no other Constantinopolitan patriarch who um, could uh, really um, oppose uh, the emperor imperial authority with such uh, such an energy would, would that Vodzu's had had demonstrated, and. The um, by the way, Fotsius was the same guy who basically um, I hate to put it in <laughs> the same guy, but ca calling Fotsius a guy sounds so bad. But I mean, he still was, <laughs> and, and um, he was the same person, say, <laughs> same patriarch who, um, who was extremely um, intransigent also towards um, towards uh, uh, the Roman Church, actually. I mean. The, the the Roman Pope, um, because at that time the popes were developing already some ambition. You have to think that Rome at this point was formally uh, a bit of a, a, a very peculiar situation that the popes were exploiting a great benefit of themselves, because they were formally within the Holy Roman Empire now, or whatever it was called, it like Roman Empire in a way, because the Holy Roman Empire is something as a name that comes much later, but de facto that that's what we're talking about. Um, but at the same time, Rome was a city that had a very strong connection with Constantinople all the time. Um, Rome has lots of Byzantine influences at this time still, even though the Byzantines do not control it at all. Um, so the, um, the, the popes, the Roman popes were extremely clever. Uh, they managed basically to, you know, to back either the 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 Ottonians uh, at this time were already uh, still the Carolingians, by the way. But however, the the the, the Western Empire this and the Eastern Empire, according to conveniency, and part of the reason why the, the Roman Church acquired so much power was exactly this frontier position between, you know, being uh, the uh, the westernmost uh, Byzantine nominally Byzantine domains and the, uh, the southernmost um, Holy Roman Imperial uh, say domains and uh, uh, playing into this gray area f to strengthen pa uh, papal power and and Fotsius in 867 uh, excommunicated the Roman Pope uh, Nicholas the first um, was Pope between 858 to 867 um, and uh, um, so eventually Fotsius was so this is very important because it's actually showing that the Constantinopolitan Church Patriarchate was essentially trying to r recover even just like the like the Roman Pope was doing uh, um, this kind of uh, universal uh, lead of the church. You have to think, in fact, it is something that is often overlooked. I talked about this, especially in the councils, um, in the video about the councils of uh, Toledo, that, uh, th that, that was happening in Visigothic Spain, but it was extremely important because the idea is that, you know, now we came later with this idea of the Middle Ages uh, that mostly on average from the low Middle Ages where the papacy was already there uh, and it was already uh, recognized in the whole Western world as the lead and the, uh, the religious uh, lead. And, uh, but during early medieval times, actually this did not exist as a concept. I mean, there were the, these um, metropolitic seats um, that had a sort of dignity, actually Rome being uh, the, the, the place of um, of martyrdom of of Saint Peter and Saint Paul had uh, had uh, recognized since uh, um, late Rome antique times this um, primacy, uh, this symbolic primacy of charity, so-called, uh, in the Christian world. But that d 
didn't really mean that the Roman Church was at the head of anything. I mean, every church was at the head of its. Um, I mean, ev every diocese was at the head uh, of its diocese, <laughs> in fact, and and that's it. But in early medieval times, were mm, in this sense, there was a lot of political fragmentations, and and the church was one of the few institutions that basically were standing at the time. Um, even in in continuity with the Roman state, telling the truth, uh, there was this idea that one of the various dioceses was developing a sort of um, ideological uh, primacy over the other, and the the biggest of uh, fight was definitely between Rome and Constantinople. So this episode with Fotius, obviously we will talk about Fotius in more detail in another video, but I think this is very meaningful because this re revival of 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 Europe at the, that time was implying that these seats that had survived from say the so-called dark ages that were not no, no dark at all if not for the absence of sources m many times but th they were actually reviving these uh, ancient r rivalries mm, uh, that had been uh, by the way harbored also because of these uh, weakness of the empire that had not managed basically to to administrate the ecclesiastical affairs because these other dioceses were in the west and they had been basically lost for centuries so at this time where the Byzantine Empire is uh, re-expanding in power especially now we will arrive to the territorial expansion and you realize that these problems were starting to rise once again because at that point Rome might have been uh, reconquered by the Byzantines, so th this created a lot of problems for the popes, and these prerogatives were not just debated on because of theological, strictly religious problems, which were important because formal problems, I either from a theological or a juridical point of view at the time, was were really uh, the ultimate um, thing to settle matters, to sanction certain things by right, because right was so so very important into medieval Europe. Um, but th they had also broader, um, um, let's say, broader meanings, um, implications, let's say. Um, and so, and, and Fotius, by the way, got deposed that the Council of Constantinople between, uh, that was held between 869 and, and 870 uh, by the, the will of the Emperor Basil I. So here, that's where with whom the the the, the Macedonian uh, dynasty starts, and by making a pretty clear political stand, that is to say, okay, we we don't want the uh, the patriarch to that to get this powerful in these matters. Also, because by the way, um, Basil the first at the time didn't want to make um, enemy uh, with the Pope because so. You you understand it, it's as if there there had been two different states within the empire, the church and the state. So it's uh, at this point the Macedonian dynasty tried to 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 stem the uh, ecclesiastical powers uh, as well. So every emperor then eventually did different things. So I don't want to approximate brutally, but this was the trend. And uh, that early medieval ecclesiastical autonomy kind of um, ended. Um, in the following centuries. So passing to territorial expansionism, so finally here we have this beautiful map in the background that uh, that shows us even, I, I like maps because they give you this uh, immediate um, visual, uh, th this immediate extensional dimension of how, look at how big this thing was, really even think of all the problems to actually manage an empire like this. And and no surprise, uh, Constantinople was the only power to have a state uh, worth of this name into Europe because this is really what you you could have not controlled these lands otherwise. Not that others were other that others were wars. They, they, the Western European powers did pretty amazing things as well by this time. But hey, look at this. Uh, and um, so passing so looking at the map, which is always the, the nicest thing to do, in my opinion, when you study history. Uh, if you think to study history without knowing geography, change job, <laughs> because <laughs> that doesn't really make sense. 
Um, so this will strength this strengthening of the empire, as we've said, was also uh, on the back of this territorial expansion, and it would have not been possible otherwise. So everything had an effect um, on on the other at this point. So um, the uh, the Macedonian dynasty, as we've said, is is a renown as a sort of military dynasty. The military successes of the Byzantines during this time were pretty pretty much amazing. Um, hopefully we will talk about that in, in, in some military history video. Today we will just keep it simple in general. Um, so um, the major, uh, actually the major territorial expansion, uh, the major damage, let's say, um, uh, the, 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 the powers that got most, mostly damaged by Byzantine expansion were the Isla Islamic ones. Mm -hmm. So, um, Cilicia, uh, Kilikia, was taken from uh, the Arabs. You see, you see it here. It's this area. T today is in, in Turkey, ironically, sp <laughs> ironically speaking, in part in also in, in Syria. Then Cappadocia, it was this important um, um, uh, land, uh, pretty mountainous area, telling the tree of... of um, I mean, uh, it's mostly a plateau, actually. It's in the Anatolian plateau, in the very co core of the Anatolian plateau. Now, the the the, the Anatolian plateau would, would grow I increasingly important from a strategical point of view for the Byzantines, because th this was the area wha where the major um, uh, military estates were. Uh, were. So even the, free, the, the uh, extremely feared Byzantine heavy cavalry that so many successes obtained in these centuries and on which we discussed so much recently was actually uh, uh, recorded from, from this area, so it was very important to, to keep it uh, secured. Um, and then also certain expeditions took place in Armenia, in Armenia with some success. Now obviously Armenia was always the, the easternmost area of the empire and it was a bit of a Frontier air, but still the Byzantines managed to to recover part of it and to hold to hold them successfully. Uh, another um, actually short-lived conquest was the one of Edessa in Syria. Uh, it was, however, a, a major victory at the time. Uh, it was conquered by uh, the Emperor Romanus Lecapenus, and the Kafirs focus instead, uh, while he was not still emperor, but still one of the major uh, military leaders at the time, one of his greatest commanders in medieval history, by the way, um, did this extreme amazing feat of recovering Crete in 961. Now, Crete was very important, as we said it before, because eventually it was a very fertile land. There were lots of uh, imperial estates that were there. Another interesting thing here is that, uh, exactly, is when you recover a, a land, especially to a foreign enemy, yeah, Crete was Greek, but uh, in the sense it had had uh, 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 an Arab domination for for centuries at that point, um, it's, it's that you can um, reorganize everything from scratch. So uh, you can seize everything you want and organize it as you like. Even in patrimonial uh, terms, it's pretty interesting uh, thing. It's pretty interesting thing to do. And Crete was very very important. Um, the because um, th this had been one of the first territories actually to fall into the uh, Arab hands, to the Arab uh, piracy, let's say, um, and um, and and Crete has this major strategical importance because it's if you look at this map, look at uh, it's uh, really halfway between Italy and Syria, so. Uh, uh, at this time, the major trades, um, were a trade that was happening in the Mediterranean was on this route. So retaking Crete was like um, giving uh, an extremely great uh, spin to the uh, spin-off to to um, trade with the West. The word shifted in in this sense from from the Arabs to the Byzantines. And this was very important. So think all also what also this triggered in in economic in political terms. Because one thing is trading with the Arabs, because paradoxically, you know, all, especially with all these uh, all those um, semi-autonomous southern Italian cities that were on the lead in this sense for maritime 
expansion at this point in the Mediterranean. And, you know, one thing was to trade with the Arabs, saying, okay, we, we don't owe you anything because you are you are Ethan and formal enemies, but hey, let's trade together. One thing it was when Crete was retaken from Byzantine Empire, by the Byzantine Empire, and, and now uh, those trades uh, pass also through what Constantinople decided. So this meant a great, uh, also greater um, Byzantine uh, political influence on onto these southern uh, Italian lands that were about to be recovered also by by the same Constantinople. So there was also a, um, another expansion, in, um, uh, a further expansion into Syria, and and especially with the conquest of two major cities that are Aleppo and uh, Antioch. Uh, Antioch was also, uh, these were pretty pretty important cities at the time, and Antioch was very important. And also it had been one of the uh, old um, um, uh, Christian metropoli uh, metrop metropolitic seats. Mm. So even uh, under Islamic domination, there were Christians in here, naturally, and um, and, and uh, the Christian uh, r communities were extremely important also in the political matters of the of the Islamic powers and recovering Antioch was very very big so you you had this see here you see here between uh, Cilicia and Antioch and C Cyprus you have this area that I I you, you can't see even for defending it you can send resources from all around so it, it, these were very very important um, and very glorious um, um, conquests of, of the Byzantines on this frontier. Naturally, this remained, in fact, just a frontier area. Mm -hmm. At this time, um, like in old time, pre-industrial times, the, the frontiers were pretty um, permeable, we can say. W there wasn't really a line that said, okay, here begins the Byzantine Empire, welcome. Um, um, it uh, you know, the, the were let's say the, the, these frontiers were built around um, fortifications that were scattered here and there, and uh, there was a lot of fighting here. There was a lot also of, of, of actually pretty well documented details about military history of, on, on that area, and we will surely talk about that one at one time. Um, and with 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 John Symmachus, other famous Byzantine emperor, who ruled from 969 to 976, uh, there was a um, another. This also was short-lived in part. Uh, the um, the reconquest of Lebanon and, and and parts of Palestine, as well. That Think even about the the ideological thing. I mean, it was this a uh, 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 crusade ante lit literum in practice, because recovering the holy places of Christianity was definitely one of the first duties of the uh, Roman emperors, and that had not been feasible for for many centuries. So, but it wasn't really that time the great time before. It was just three hundred years. So. Even the continuities with the local traditions, the Byzantine influence, w were were still there, even at, of uh, with with Islamic domination. It's not that the 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 Arabs conquered er there and these areas were lost completely and detached from the West. I mean, it was still very um, the were cultures were really pretty much uh, in dialogue one with each other, it weren't just about okay, k uh, killing each other. Really, uh, on the contrary, that was the you know, also wars went on every once in a while, also because resources <laughs> couldn't allow such a constant uh, infight. So, uh, another major uh, direction of expansionism, and you see here in the north, was in the Black Sea and in the Balkans, so in the north. Um, and this was a major problem chiefly for um, well, th th every frontier here corresponded to different enemy. The Byzantines at this time were involved, pa practically fighting <laughs> um, on, on all the frontiers. Um, and uh, the, um, the Balkans were occupied by the Bulgars. At this time, they basically became Bulgarians uh, in the end. You know that the Bulgars were this Turkish people that uh, came from the steppes, uh, like just like the Avars or the Hungars and all. And eventually, however, they weren't demographically uh, enormous, so they soon um, 
blended with these local Slavic um, populations. So we say that they became Bulgarians. In fact, Bulgarian is, is uh, Bulgarians is Slav, and they speak a Slavic language. And I, I was told, I was asked, by the way, once by a Bulgarian follower that I I, I want to thank. By the way, take cash. He 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 asked me, why why don't you talk about Bulgaria, medieval Bulgaria? And we'll we'll arrive to that. I'm I'm really thinking about it because Balkanic history is very important to me. I think it's very very overlooked. And Bulgarian history is very fascinating, especially at this time that Bulgarians had this huge empire that encompassed uh, huge parts of, of the Balkans. And, and this is why the, the Byzantines were so worried and tried to resize the, uh, the Bulgarian power. So there was actually a lot of warfare going on between this. And the Bulgarians were even um, kind of, I mean, to, to keep them at bay, the, 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 the Roman emperors had kind of granted, recognized them the title of Caesar to them, the Tsar, mm -hmm. uh, that is this title you find in all the Slavic, in this Slavic imperialistic uh, powers eventually went into to Russia. Um, in, um, and and it obviously the, even the Bulgarians even were, were granted to, to have a kind of a, their own autonomous Orthodox Church, so this was very important. Obviously the Byzantines saw that from their own perspective to be like the Bulgarians to be part of the empire. Okay. Well, the Bulgarians <laughs> thought themselves to be a parallel empire to the one of Constantinople, and surely not inferior to it. So, different perspectives, but a political conveniency trying to to mix up things. And another major threat at this time was uh, a new, f uh, a new, fresh, young threat. That was the one of the Rus. Uh, so the, it was basically the this um, uh, Slavic principalities born out of uh, certain of the, um, say, uh, Varangian, that is, uh, Viking uh, uh, initiative and in invasion. And they, I made a video uh, not so recently, but if you're interested about the early Rus, I made a video about it. Uh, now I don't remember. It was like the early Rus and, the br uh, yeah, ninth century Russia, that roughly deals with this period as well. Um, so if you're interested, you may want to check that out. Um, and um, I... Um, what were we saying? Oh yeah, that uh, indeed the Russians launched uh, offensive into... Uh, up to the same uh, Constantinople was actually besieged both in 860 and in 907. So these were the Russians were a major threat and this is very interesting because you know we don't know excessively much about the Russians at that time we know much more obviously about Western Europe but the fact that they had the strength to 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 create uh, even think about the supplies the logistics to 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 send a fleet through the Black Sea and to besiege Constantinople it was basically the best defended city uh, at the time I also think the largest one. Uh, I mean, this was pretty amazing, and it, it gives you the dimension of how the Rus were 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 a threat. Actually, uh, eventually, the, the, the Russians became friends. <laughs> I can say it like that. Uh, they got this time they were pagan. Then eventually, they got Christianized. They, they married uh, Byzantine princesses. They felt uh, they were allies of Constantinople most of the times, and even there, that we were naturally. Nobody was friend to each other, truly. Um, but it was an opportunity for the Russians, and that's how Russian got orthodox in thinking, say, that of its um, Roman legacy, at least in imperial, uh, say, in imperial perspective, and also religious one. Um, so the um, which entailed the religious one. So uh, the mm, the Bulgarians were uh, came out finally uh, destroyed, actually by the Byzantines, or at least um, they were destroyed f for for a couple of centuries. They they really didn't have the strength to to recover once again as a you know they, they had to wait essentially for Constantinople to be destroyed by the Crusaders that for, for in order to 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 become another major player into the Balkanic uh, scenario. 
uh, at least autonomously, and um, they were defeated famously at the Battle of the Strumitsa uh, River in 1014 by Basil II. And then, uh, fr from from that now onwards, was uh, named uh, was nicknamed uh, Bulgaroctonos, that is, the exterminator of the uh, Bulgarians. And this, by the way, was probably even um, these nicknames the emperors had weren't really, you know, they were no emperors were known like that. It's not that they figured like a, a, a really, uh, as a real cognomen, like in in, um, in the um, uh, in the ancient times. But really, Basil II, he he would have been preferred to be called Porphyrogenitus, by the way. Um, the uh, um, the uh, uh, th this is one of the actually uh, one of the main Basil II was one of probably the greatest not just Roman the, the greatest uh, Roman emperor in medieval times but actually also um, the greatest military commander one of the greatest military commanders in history telling the truth and he was an extraordinary man actually uh, uh, the, um, the 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 idea uh, is that he it really fought uh, against a, a huge amount of peoples, including the Bulgarians, and really destroying this major Bulgarian threat that up to that point had been really definitely a, a very um, a very serious business, also because the Bulgarians were pretty close to Constantinople. So uh, there was always this inc incumbent problem that could be a very, strate a very big strategic uh, weakness for the same empire. And 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 this uh, the destruction of the Bulgarian Empire in this sense uh, brought to uh, a, 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 um, a huge expansion of Byzantine influence all over the Balkans. Mm. So at this point, the, the, the Balkanic Peninsula comes back under the control of Constantinople, and it's uh, reorganized also uh, administratively speaking um, with the Temata. Mm. Um, because these areas had been practically, and also from a religious point of view, we have seen that Bulgarians had created their own church, were already uh, orthodox at this time. And this um, was actually a very important moment, because you can see here that Constantinople basically came to, 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 to rule uh, more or less um, directly from basically the, the mouth of the Danube, uh, until Croatia, until Istria almost. So this had a huge strategical impact. So we, with a victory, by the way, the, we, we, uh, with the Battle of the Strumitsa River, as we said, we were in 1014. Now, you have to think of 1014 Europe, what it meant to be annihilated in open field. It meant that basically your whole demographical and economical resources were wiped out for generations in one battle. So uh, this is typical if you want to understand also military history of the time is that uh, how few resources there actually were and in this sense how this major pitch battles really had an effect on 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 on, on, uh, on a strategical scale in, in such a large uh, uh, measure. And, and, and recovering these lands because these lands had been practically lost by Constantinople with the with the Slavic, uh, let's say during the migration era, it's not that really the the, cons the the Byzantines didn't control them because we have seen even with the with the Bulgarian Empire, uh, the Slavs weren't really a, a, at that time a, you know were just clans essentially. They they came as far as Peloponnese, even Greece was heavily uh, Slavic, especially in the interland. Um, but I mean there, there weren't threat. But even what was a Bulgarian par you know, empire, Constantinople had some sort of control in those areas. But it wasn't direct. So when now the the Bulgarians collapsed, the um, there was a, a, a wall reorganization. By the way, this um, Danubian frontier was always a bit out of reach at the time because infrastructurally speaking, it was a uh, pretty much desolated. So it even didn't make sense to restructure it. There weren't simply the resources to do such a thing at the time. But it was still pretty useful because leaving it deserted and with just some garrison here and there or with some client state, etc., it could help. It could really form a, a great um, shield, let's say, 
um it uh, i mean it 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 made the the northern frontier much deeper so for anyone who wanted to advance it was very difficult to do it to reach Constantinople from the north because there were these lots of various uh, layers of defense uh it was mostly political right before then in even military actual military defense and infrastructures of garrison there by the way, uh, by the way, the, the Balkanic uh, interlands are uh, a nightmare uh, in terms of mm, as battlegrounds. The, the, they're very tough uh, terrains to to remain. In fact, this frontier basically remained historically speaking, e even with the uh, Ottoman Empire. That's as far as they could get because even the local populations were pretty difficult to control. Mm. In fact, here you see that Serbia and Croatia were under the Byzantine Empire, but he here in the map it justly says that, that there were autonomous principalities in practice. And this was also important, however, because um, these peoples, in a way or in another, came into, uh, they were already like that, but th they came even closer to the, um, culturally speaking, to Constantinople. Like the Balkans were split essentially in two. There was a, uh, uh, um, let's say, a Germanic Roman Catholic influence and a, um, in fact, Croatia would become uh, Catholic in practice, and um, eventually, and 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 this um, and Serbia, for instance, was art. It, it still is Orthodox, and um, so this was um, more than even for for the local matters. It was extremely important at, at an international level because basically, the uh, the the Roman emperor, uh, excuse me, the 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 Germanic emperors at this time in, in from Central Europe and in Italy, were extremely worried at this point of the um, uh, Byzantine interference. Bi the Byzantines came at this point even to be very influential on the uh, Magyars, on the Hungars. This is the time into which the the Hungarian kingdom is practically founded. Now Hungary f f fitted into actually the the Western sphere. Uh, just like Bohemia, just like Poland, but uh, th there was still pretty much a, a big... I mean, the, Unga the Hungarians really played on both sides. Hmm? They were defeated by the Ottonians and settled down and, and Christianized by them uh, as Roman Catholics, but there was still pretty much... Th they could be, as everyone at this time, really uh, sneakily playing uh, from one side or the other, like being backed either by Constantinople or by, by Germany, um, and and they highly benefited from it. And and by the way, the Magyars became the Hungarians became as well as enemies of Constantinople. Um, like back in the day when there were the Avars in there, um, and so the Danubian frontier was still intact, I would say. So I think this this, this was very important about the, the Balkans, especially. Um, and so after having done this the empire was ready for so you have secured essentially the uh, the eastern frontier you have look at the map you have this solid anatolian lands they're also pretty easy to defend because the frontier for ins first of all it's outside of anatolia proper uh so the the the, the inner sides are pretty pacified uh you have this control in the black sea the Russians progressively were, were defeated and, and, and made allies. You have got once again this trade opened into the south uh, with Crete and all. You have got this major expansion in influence in the Balkans that also secures uh, Constantinople, Greece, etc. So what's the next target? That's Italy. And Italy is also fighting against the, the Ottonian Empire. And not only, because there were also other powers in here. So the Italian uh, adventure was also uh, probably also the most interesting because of this blurry uh, political conditions were there in the relatively distance from Constantinople that however reveals how the, the, the Byzantines were committed in recovering southern Italy. It was very intensely urbanized, uh, it was rich, it had this um, trade position, was pretty uh, pretty amazing for them and it was close to Rome. It uh, implied the control over the, the Western Church in this sense. Um, so it was a very, very important area to recover. 
So in southern Italy, the Macedonian dynasty basically um, 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 this the, um, this major reconquest and that started from the end of the 9th century. Uh, at this point, the Byzantines were instrumental to kick out the Saracens from large areas of, of Italy. So um, even though the, the major expansion occurred in Apulia, there was this, in, not surprisingly, because this is an extremely fertile area at the time, on the Adriatic Sea, and then into Calabria instead in the south. And these lands had been actually part of the uh, a duchy of, of Benevent, or at least th th that cluster of duchies into which it had split. I recently made a video that talks uh, essentially about them. Uh, not really, not necessarily mm, in, in this thing, relation with the Byzantines, mostly an internal thing, but the title is the, the, the Southern Longobards, Langobardia Minor. Mm. So if you want to look at that, it might be interesting. Um, so to make you understand what what were still the Longobards doing in there, um, and um, so they they expanded their chiefly at their um, the tradition, and 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 even recovered uh, in the process the so-called Emirate of Bari that was uh, a Saracen uh, holding, because the Saracens had expanded in southern Italy. Um, really uh, on the coast because the Saracens weren't they really didn't make a demographical policy of um, settlement they just were pirates essentially so they, they, they entrenched into these because by the way the internet populations were not so nice <laughs> towards them so they, they stuck to these uh, coastal centers and they occupied even these cities that were in there, um, uh, Taranto, for in, uh, uh, or I don't remember, yeah, Taranto was another emirate like that, and instead it was conquered by the Carolingians back. Uh, that's one of the few amazing feats of, of the Carolingian military into Italy. Um, um, so always bear in mind this presence of uh, the Carolingians and, 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 and the Carolingians and Ottonians in there at this point. Uh, at this point, not really because the Ottonians had still to rise. So it's interesting that the Byzantines were expanding into Italy in this, into this moment of gap between the the collapse, let's say, of of, Carolin of the Carolingian kingdom of Italy and and this moment in which the Ottonians weren't still uh, hadn't still managed to to uh, recover, say, the empire, er, and entering in Italy once again. Uh, so you might have want to exploit such a favorable uh, situation. So they, they, as I was saying, the Byzantines recovered also Bari. It was this major uh, city uh, into the Adriatic coast. It was this, in fact, trade and agricultural center because it controlled Apulia from in, in the interland. In fact, it remained an important center also under the Normans, and uh, and it was actually a sort of a more of a Greek city than an, an Italic one because of these southern Italian cities had always had this kind of very strong. Um, I mean, first of all, Barion ha had been a uh, Greek colony since back in the day, because these were cities of of ancient uh, Greek foundation sometimes, including Taranto. No, uh, Taranto was founded by the Spartans, for instance. Um, the um, so there was a sort of especially from these coastal cities because the interland was pretty mu pretty much longobardized while the the city coasts were 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 Greek essentially in in political affiliation and even in language sometimes so re retaking these cities was very very important also for this um, already uh, kind of Byzantine uh, local um, culture and, and interest because it's not that these cities were happy to be under someone someone in the first place they would have preferred to remain alone but mm, at least being reincorporated into the um, into the Byzantine Empire it, it equated to have more uh, trade privileges within the empire um, so, and at this time, eventually, during the 10th century, the, the Saxon emperors, uh, the Ottonians, uh, reinvade southern Italy because they are worried of the Byzantine expansion in there, and they want their exclusive relation with Rome. The Ottonians were quite keen on that. O Otto III uh, lived in Rome. He considered he the 
he was son of a Byzantine princess as well. So they, th th at this time, the Ottonians were extremely concerned about really trying to reunite the two um, empires and uh, and claiming actually for themselves the Roman legacy, the Roman, and and and, and therefore this Byzantine presence in, in southern Italy was quite threatening for them and their uh, relations with with the papacy that, as we've seen, also in other videos, had evolved during uh, as a uh, as a, le a legitimating force for. Uh, legi legitimating authority f uh, for for the uh, for the Western emperors or the Germanic emperors. So you have really to think it. Uh, it was this. It's this uh, intertwines. It is this complicated. And now we're just saying everything in synthesis. So uh, it's even way more complicated than this uh, naturally. Um, so um, the. Um, so I even in Italy, the thematic civil military administration was re uh, reestablished. Um, it is important, and so, uh, so once again, because of lands that were had been pra practically out of reach for the empire for for a long time, to to reestablish a sort of of uh, a, a stronger bond with the central government. Um, and the uh, and there were actually uh, three uh, themata that were um, built in there. Uh, the one of um, of Lango uh, of of Longbardy, let's say, there was the Apulian one. Uh, so it's interesting that uh, the Longbirds, uh, locally speaking, were so practically uh, it was such a, an identitary uh, identification with longbirds that the same Byzantine uh, tema took the name from from the longbirds that had been so such first enemies of the Byzantines back in the day um, uh, the uh, uh, tema of uh, Lucania and the tema of Calabria is these two regions in southern Italy and um, they um, Eventually, they were reincorporated into um, a broader um, district uh, uh, by the, the mid of the 10th century that was the so-called the Catepanate of Italy, mm -hmm. whose capital was Barion. Um, so, um, this... Um, um yeah th that's pretty much it and the um in, in, in two of these territories the the major important say the major attention the byzantines had was to keep basically the local church faithful because in through southern italy the local church sometimes had been had developed in a sort of um can say of lordship but let's say that it had been one of the most um first of all there were um, huge monasteries in here um the the byzantines also tried to re uh, eventually also tried to re resize uh, reconquer e uh, sicily that had this still this greek um uh, tradition monasteries that were sometimes very big very powerful um and so Having control of the church meant to have a great control on the southern Italian population of, at large, and 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 that was instrumental also for um, let's say for the relation with Rome, because Rome definitely had kept a great uh, contact with these areas as well. So um, um, uh, maintaining an authority on on that church meant also to to have a strict control on Rome. Rome, by the way, was um, still uh, definitely after the Arab invasion, especially with the Arab conquest of Sicily, uh, the popes had lost, I mean Sicily was Byzantine at the time, but the Roman church was still extremely powerful in there, had lost a huge amount of uh, estates in Sicily. Sicily is this extremely fertile land, so you think at the time that it... it what it meant. If in fact, the Roman, p uh, the papal power at that point with the Arab invasions also shrunk in practice, be and it became kind of more Italian because, in 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 perspective, and not just Mediterranean, uh, um, and not um, Mediterranean like it was before, because 
without the Sicilian resources, basically, uh, now the popes had to rely on the central Italian uh, uh, bases, let's say. Um, and um, so this was the, the Byzantine reconquest of southern Italy wasn't really seen just as a threat from Rome, but also as an opportunity to recover influence through uh, its uh, the ecclesiastical relations onto vast areas of southern Italy. And um, the the conquest of Sicily was just attempted by the Byzantines, and eventually it's just the Normans who achieved that. Um, and in fact, the, the Roman Church guides basically the Norman um, the Norman uh, conquest and and make of the Normans vassals of Rome for for this reason for controlling those territories. So here are many implications that of certain political pictures and ambitions that remained kind of um, had remained there, suspense in the air. Like back in the day, we did that, so we 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 hope it will happen again. Because the mi the early Middle Ages weren't that long, honestly. So, uh, in terms of expert, uh, and I mean, today we know how things went, <laughs> but at the time there were certain ambitions that eventually uh, were definitely uh, curbed by other events. But uh, those were the interests, uh, really, in the day. Um, so. Yeah, I think, and obviously, as we were saying before, Constantinople so fit to do this, also for reincorporating Rome um, into into its domains. Actually, Rome, uh, still at this time, is uh, in dialogue with Constantinople as if she was in still in, in into the empire in some measure. That's what they did with <laughs> with the Germanic emperors. They said something with the with the Byzantines. They did something else, and uh, it was pretty clever. But let's say that the, the, at this time, really, um, as as Westerners, we we obviously look the, uh, it mostly from from the um, from our Western European perspective. That's that is okay. The Pope now was stuck with w with the Holy Roman Empire, right? But telling the truth, up to actually the 12th century that in fact corresponded to the last attempt of the Byzantines to recover uh, Italy the popes actually were leaning more towards the east than towards the west in terms of um, of political affiliation really so this is also very interesting in, in the strategical scenario uh, the popes were pretty clever, and they they knew actually that the the only true uh, Roman Empire was was the one of the East. Um, so they they were pretty careful also at not upsetting more than much. And obviously, and and this went on even after the schism of the 11th century. So uh, as we were saying, up to the 12th, up to the uh, Byzantine invasion of uh, of the kingdom of Sicily, of uh, the Norman kingdom of Sicily, they did the, the the popes actually were looking at that. Uh, also because the popes were perfectly aware by that point that uh, even if the Byzantines had reconquered Italy, uh, the Byzantines had spies everywhere there. We know that even by the 12th century, even certain campaigns of Frederick Barbarossa were actually uh, sabotaged by the Byzantine agents. Like in first Barbarossa expedition into Italy, seemingly the the, um, the German supplies were poisoned by uh, Byzantine agents uh, operating in, in, in every single Italian city we, we at least the, the Byzantine sources claim which is true just so to tell you that the, ma the Middle Ages is not the tiny little um, uh, place that revolves around itself, this pretty naive uh, romantic picture of the Middle Ages. It was something of a very big and large and overly extended international business. Okay, and um, so uh, as we're saying, the, the 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 popes were sure that basically, even if Italy had c uh, southern Italy, uh, in best of expectations, by the way, because that uh, not the whole Italy, um, but that if that huge part of Italy had come. Uh, once again, under the Byzantines, actually the major delegates to to administrate that would have been the popes themselves. Um, so that's why they were looking at that so favorably, not because because they wanted Byzantines there, 
but because they they search for the most convenient decentralized um, position to to mind their own business and strengthen their own power we will talk about this extensively some other time so for now I um, I hope that you enjoyed this video and if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.